that what are you, uh, how do you take in uh, consideration of the neoplastic and the carcinogenic tendencies of most uh, stem cell therapy? Thank you. Sorry, uh, uh, maybe uh, I'll uh, hold up you later uh, because uh, I couldn't catch your questions correctly, so. All right. Thank, you. Thank you. Yes, let's do that. Thank you so much. That was um, Kiku Yasoi, everyone. That was a wonderful presentation. Another great presentation. We here at Health 2.0 Conference are killing it. All right, next up, our keynote is uh, on the subject of role of artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies for healthcare. Now, artificial uh, intelligence can be a powerhouse when it comes to disrupting healthcare services. While enabling healthcare pr uh, practitioners to identify day-to-day -day patterns of their patients to guide decision-making, it can also be applied to guiding uh, diagnostics and personalized medicine development. Now to talk more on this topic, can I please call on stage Ian Slade, who is the founder and CEO of IT Consulting Group, LLC. Can we please have Ian Slade on stage? I thought I was going to have the benefit of going on break first and you guys are distracted and then I'll sneak in my presentation, you wouldn't notice. Um, but thank you, thank you all for, for being here. Uh, I was asked to talk about <clears throat> how AI can help disrupt healthcare and also uh, what are the things that I'm excited about uh, in, in the very near future. And uh, towards the end, I want to talk a little bit about um, the things that we're working on in terms of uh, the metaverse and also mental health and a lot of uh, amazing things going on there. But before I jump in, uh, I'd like to have a few of the folks that flew in from California stand up. Uh, Michelle Slade, wonderful wife. Uh, Dinesh Bangara, a great friend, and his dad, uh, Dr. Suresh Bangara. Come on guys, please stand up. There you go, round of applause. <laughs> They came all the way uh, from LA, so uh, th thank you for being here. So, this is, um, I think, one of the most exciting times in healthcare because we get to look at, for someone like me who's been in the healthcare technology field for the past 20 years, it's very exciting because there's a lot coming up in, in really fast uh, order. And bef let's jump right in. It's hard to read that, I'll just look up here. <laughs> So a little bit about myself, um, started uh, different companies, IT Consulting Group, as mentioned earlier. I also started the Healthcare Project Management Association. Uh, last year, we now have 2,000 members from more than 50 countries, and we're trying to advance healthcare project management. How do we do that better? And uh, recently, I'm working with uh, Dr. Bangara and Dinesh uh, to look at the metaverse healthcare, what we can do in that space. Uh, all right. <laughs> and um, my focus has been on digital transformation. Uh, I am grateful to be awarded uh, globally in terms of advocacy, leadership, and artificial intelligence. And the picture here was from last week. Uh, this is the one that I'm most proud of. It is the advocate of the year, not because of the award, but because of what we were able to do in California. Over the past seven years, we've been advocating for the governor to increase the funding for uh, broadband and, and uh, this will improve uh, digital equity, which uh, will help uh, not just healthcare, but also education and all the different sectors that will need the internet. So I'm happy to announce that last October, uh, the governor signed $6 billion to help uh, the broadband infrastructure in California, which will help 98% of Californians have access to telemedicine. And uh, with you know, the pandemic <laughs> and whatnot, uh, it is a good time to have telemedicine. All right, so why artificial intelligence? You know, there's a lot of topics that we can talk about, but I'm really excited about artificial intelligence, not just because of the different areas that we can go into, but from a business standpoint, if you're looking at uh, something to you to vote your time into before the end of this decade, we're looking at a trillion dollar industry, right? And, and in this very narrow segment, there's so much that you can do with artificial intelligence, but just in healthcare technology, it's a trillion dollar uh, industry. All right, now for 
all of the history buffs in the audience, I put together here the AI timeline. Uh, as you can see, we started out in the 50s with the Turing test. Uh, then we came up, uh, as you can see here, uh, for me, 1997 was a very sad day for all of you who are chess fans when Garry Kasparov was beat by Deep Blue. Uh, that was a turning point where in, you know, the computer finally surpassed us in chess. And as you can see, the different timelines here. IBM Watson is very interesting, 2011. Uh, there's a lot of promise. And, uh, is anyone familiar with IBM Watson? There we go, a few hands, great, great. Uh, one of the things that we'll talk about it here a little bit later is the problem with clinical uh, decision uh, support, right? And Watson can help with that, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. And from Watson, we go to Alexa. I think everyone here is uh, familiar with Alexa, with Siri. All these devices that we, we tend to use without really thinking about it, but all the algorithms that happens behind the scene so that we can access these things is, is just amazing. And you know, 2017, AlphaGo, uh, one of the you know, hardest games is the Go game, and uh, the computer uh, beat the human, obviously, uh, at this point, and, and learned it you know, uh, without uh, a lot of instruction. So AI is quickly, rapidly becoming uh, smarter than a human intelligence. Now, as you can see here, in terms of the evolution, not trip. So we have what's called the artificial narrow intelligence, right? These are uh, functionalities where you're just looking at one task and it's doing one, uh, performing one function, right? And then you get into the artificial general intelligence, where, where, where it's trying to replicate a human intelligence. Uh, for those of you who've been following Neuralink. That is the goal, and hopefully it will get to super intelligence where it, it exceeds you know, what the human mind can do. And, and not just in terms of logic, but also in terms of art, uh, what we call intuition. So that is a very, very exciting future. Now, AI is everywhere, as we know. Uh, hold on. But in healthcare, uh -huh. put my glasses on. Hold on. <laughs> there you go. So I started out at the bedside as a trauma nurse, and one of the things that was really hard and truly is uh, life or death is, is care coordination, right? Getting the right care at the right time when you need it the most. And I think that um, AI can definitely help in that regard. Uh, and with better care coordination, of course, you have improved clinical outcomes, and then the experience is better uh, for the patient and the family. Now, efficiency. For those of you who worked in a hospital, you know that one of the things that we drastically need is, is more efficient processes. You know, there's a lot of busy work that we do, and because of that, there's, you know, we, we suffer in terms of clinical outcomes, but also in terms of financial outcomes. Now, expanding consumer and clinical access. So the goal is to ultimately provide care where our customers are, right? Right now, a lot of times, you know, for you to receive care, you have to go either to outpatient, to inpatient. Hopefully, we'll be able to use AI to help track and alert you of things before uh, you actually have symptoms, before you even know that there's something going on. And, and that is a very exciting future, because if you think about it, just from a process flow, uh, you will drastically disrupt that, oh, I'm not feeling good, let me go uh, to an outpatient, inpatient. But before you start feeling bad, you have AI telling you, hey, uh, I noticed that you're experiencing this, um, how are you feeling right now? Uh, what if we do this? So before you get to the curative part, of medicine, right, uh, you now drastically shift to the preventive and promotive, which is something that uh, we haven't been really good at. All right, so where are we spending a lot of our time, effort, and energy? If you look at the technologies that will be driving innovation in healthcare, you can see there's a lot being spent on data management. Now, the part that I'm pretty interested in, let me see, I have 11 more minutes. Uh, 
is, is augmented reality, which is right now we're just at 17%. And I wish that, you know, in the next few years, we can drastically increase that because I, I do really think that, especially in the mental health realm, there's so much that we can do that we haven't been able to do uh, because of limitations in technology. Now, same thing here for uh, the use cases. There's a lot of focus on clinical decision support and a lot of focus on extracting meaning from, from the data. I think one thing we can all agree upon is that we have enough data, right? We have enough data. What we don't have is the ability to quickly convert data into meaningful information so you can act upon it uh, before you get to the curative part of healthcare. So these are just examples that I want to throw in in the 10 minutes that I have left. Uh, as you can see here, when we partner AI with pathology, uh, you increase uh, the success rate and drastically drop the error rate here, 85%. Uh, smart microscope, has anyone heard about this? You have, oh, cool, cool. So this is something super exciting for those of you who haven't. So smart microscope in real time uh, helps you categorize blood infections. Now for those of you who work in healthcare, you know that um, we throw a lot of antibiotics on patients with the hopes that one of them will hit it, right? The shotgun approach. Imagine if you can, with 93% accuracy, figure it out in almost uh, near real time and figure out the treatment, right? Another thing, and this is with Google uh, AI, 98% um, accuracy to tell if diabetes will hamper your eyesight. Uh, I have a colleague, his name is Dr. Daniel Kraft. He's working with Google and with Stanford, and they're doing a lot of innovative things in terms of, again, focus, shifting the focus from preventive, uh, from, from curative into preventive, and being able to tell, you know, if your diabetes will hamper your eyesight before you have symptoms, right? For those of you in, uh, in ophthalmology, you know that by the time you start getting symptoms, it, it's almost a little too late. You're now focused more on the curative side. Nine minutes. All right, AI uh, in robotic surgery. Imagine doing surgery, and while you're doing surgery, you can tell if the tissue uh, is normal, or if the tissue is benign, if the tissue is malignant, and that is what uh, is coming up in terms of robotic surgery. And aside from that, as you all know, we can now do uh, remote uh, robotic surgery as well. So if you need access to the best neurosurgeon, and happens to be in England, uh, you're here in Dubai, they can perform that. All right. Now, there's a lot of talk about health tracking and wellness applications, and there's definitely a lot of uses for it, but one of the things that I'm really excited about is the dosage, dosage error reduction. So currently, you know, you go to the doctor's office, give you medication, give you the dose, but as we all know, things ebb and flow, right? Maybe for this day, you don't need that much medication because of what happened, you know, you didn't get enough sleep or whatever the case might be. We don't have that capability, right? We're, 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 not, we're not adjusting dosages based on what happened to you right now, right? So imagine a time we're in that can happen. And I have here, um, here in this top five emerging trends uh, in wearables, where you're gathering meaningful information. And for those of you who are unfortunate enough to be getting all this wearable information in your doctor's offices, it's right now it's still garbage because there's so much coming in and you're just not able to pay attention. So imagine if you can actually get not the data, but meaningful information that you can act upon right away and create uh, automated pathways that you don't even have to think about. It just tells the patient what to do. We're not there yet. Smart pills. So imagine being able to take a pill and depending on uh, what your blood sugar is, for example, it adjusts the amount that's being released into your bloodstream. There's a lot of amazing work being done at Stanford right now. Again, uh, Daniel Kraft is leading this there. Uh, he's also working with Singularity. And that is something super exciting. For those of you that worked in the emergency room, you know, a lot of patients come in because of either the dosage was too high or too low for that patient that day. 
Does that make sense? Right? So if you can adjust that with a smart pill that knows how much to deliver, that is a true game changer, especially for the elderly patients. I mean, you're just happy if they take the right drug that day, right? let alone uh, the drug that they need. 3D bioprinting, this is amazing because as we all know, a lot of patients die waiting for an organ. So if we can really uh, get to massive production levels with bioprinting, then the organ shortage won't be a thing. All right, five more minutes. Um, extended reality. So real life, augmented reality, mixed reality, virtual reality. There's a lot that we can do in the virtual reality space. And that is really what I want to talk to you guys about today. And the last one in terms of uh, <clears throat> the trends that are coming up is preventing a pandemic. So there's a lot of data coming in. Last week I was in Orlando, I was talking to the chief data scientist from Canada, and I said, so we have two years of global data now looking at the pandemic. Knowing what you know now, what would you have told, for example, Dr. Fauci? Uh, she was one of the advisors. Knowing what you know now, what would you tell different? You know what she said? That's a good question. <laughs> that is a really sad answer from a chief data scientist. I won't name names. But the, the fact of the matter is we're still far. Forget, forget preventing pandemics. After the pandemic, looking at the data, and then hindsight saying, okay, what could we have done differently? Is that like, that's a good question. Uh, here's a data point for you. The U.S. and Canada, they have totally different health systems, right? Canada is more uh, centralized, you know. Uh, the U.S. is more fee-for-service. So very different approaches. Here's an interesting fact for you. The African-American community is hit heaviest both in the U.S. and in Canada. And no one knows really why. And we have chief data scientists from around the world. And during the last day of the conference, I got a chance to sit down with them and say, why do you guys think this is the case? And they said, that is a good question. And this is very sad because we have all this data, right? We have supercomputers, yet we, we can't even do a formal autopsy of the pandemic we had. Forget trying to prevent a pandemic. We're not even there yet. But with AI, with advancements, I think that we can eventually get there by honing in on factors that right now we might not think is, is consequential. But maybe that's what you know, caused, in this case, the African-American group to suffer the most in two very different environments and very different healthcare settings. Three minutes. All right. Metaverse. So, for the geeks in the audience, seven layers of the metaverse. You have the infrastructure, everything from 5G, uh, human interface, mobile, smart glasses, uh, decentralization, where you're going into the blockchain. Uh, Dinesh, this one's for you. <laughs> uh, spatial computing, 3D engines, uh, and, and now all the way up to experiences. And that's the part that I'm really excited about, is, is the experience. Now, on my way in, I was talking to a, a passenger, and he told me a story about how he has a six-year-old kid that has a learning disability and is really struggling because the school that his kid is going to uh, is not well equipped to, to help his kid with the disability. And I was telling him about uh, this whole metaverse, uh, mental health, and all that that I'm working on uh, with uh, Suresh and Dinesh in the back. And then he said, what can I do to make that technology available today? Because my kid is not just not learning, but also not experiencing life as other kids have right now. And he, he started to get very teary-eyed because currently there's, there's there's nothing for him. He's been to the U.S., to Paris. He's been around the world, Switzerland. And, and his kid, unfortunately, has other things going on. And right now, they all told him, I'm so sorry, but 
basically, we, we don't have anything for you right now, right? Now, with the metaverse, we can have a different paradigm, in this case, uh, to mental health. And in his particular example, it was a mixture of, of autism, learning disability, and other things. And, and the problem is, it took us so long to get here. As you can see in the slide, uh, everyone uh, from going back 2,000 years had a different opinion as to why mental health or mental disease is. Yeah? Why is it that we have these issues? Everything from it must have been the spirits, right? Or it's in your blood. Um, but what we're learning now is that it's a combination of genetics, environment, lifestyle, and there's a lot more that we don't know. Uh, I was telling Dinesh the other day, I, I think that we're trying to figure out mental health by looking through a keyhole, right, and trying to figure out what's inside the Sistine Chapel. We just don't have the right technology just yet. But I think that if we use um, the upcoming technology and, and bring that into uh, mental health, that we can drastically make a difference. So to this point, if you go to uh, a mental health professional, and you, let's say you're going through guided imagery, a lot of times they would tell you, OK, well, have a seat, calm down, and then let's um, close your eyes and, and picture a place that you want to be in, be it the ocean, be it the forest, whatever it is that, that makes you calm. Take deep breaths, go through the process, and see if I can calm you down, right? So for thousands of years, that has been the process. Soon, the process is, instead of closing your eyes, open your eyes, and while having AR and VR, let's see that together. Let me see how you're feeling right now. Do you see yourself today as a roaring tiger? Or do you see yourself today as a scared mouse? Right? How are you feeling right now? How can I help you with where you are right now? And as a mental health practitioner, you don't have to guess, because you can see how they're feeling. And this is the promise that I think, which is very exciting, that the metaverse has. And we're barely touching into it. I showed you the slide earlier, 17%. And this is just the investment, not the product that's on the market, which is you know, basically zero right now. So I'm out of time. Uh, <laughs> let me get through. Um, let me just say that um, this, is a, this is a future that I'm really excited about. This is a future that I think we can really make a difference in. And you know, in, in technology, we, we, we use the phrase, change the world right, a lot, it's become a cliche. But I really think that with AR, with VR, in the metaverse, for those of you who are suffering from mental illness or taking care of someone, this truly is a tool that will change your world. Thank you so much. All right. Cool, now we're going for, to break? I, no. No. <laughs> if you want, you can take one question. Does anyone have any questions? One question. You're allowed one question. Yep, there you go. Thank you. If it's a hard one, I can't hear you. No, it's a, honestly, it's an easy question. I'm thinking of Stuart Russell, who's one of my favorite uh, computer science AI mm -hmm. professors from Stanford. And when he was asked the question, what could you get AI to do in the next decade that would be the most significant thing? As one of the leaders of the field, one of the writers of the great textbook, he said to be able to tell fake news from real news. <laughs> I would like to know <laughs> if you could choose one thing, and maybe bearing in mind the info war that went with the pandemic, right. what would be the one thing that you think is most important for AI and healthcare? That's a great question. Uh, for those of you uh, who didn't hear that, so in the next 10 years, what is the one thing that AI can do that would be the most important? Um, for me personally, uh, I think it's in the mental health space uh, only because we are so behind in the paradigm of, of dealing with it. You know, compared to surgery, you know, you can do a CT scan, MRI. Uh, with, with, with mental health, we're, we're in the dark. 
-hmm. Like if, if, if Sigmund Freud showed up today, he'd be like, dude, I did that 200 years ago. What, what, what's, up with, what's up here? So I think that's the, the biggest thing. Uh, in terms of outside of healthcare, I think being able to tell fact from fiction, as you mentioned, fake news from real news, what is really going on without the bias of, of the producers, the editor, clickbait, making money, take that out of the equation and really see things as they are, I think is going to be one of the biggest things that AI can do. Yeah. And with that, can we go on break? <laughs> <laughs> no break. All right. Thank you so much, Ian. That was wonderful.